I am pleased to help open our group's second seminar virtually hosted here in Israel. While it's unfortunate that we could not meet in person, I'm grateful for the opportunities of technology and, more importantly, for the efficient organization of Erga and Roman, as well as the leadership of Suavomir and Chris, to allow us to gather online. My talk picks up with some critical directions open last time. Specifically, this paper dovetails with Erga's presentation from the previous seminar based in Lublin. Erga spoke about Orior Lev, among Israel's preeminent authors of children's literature, and his best-known book, The Island on Bird Street, a realistic adventure tale, a Robinsonade about a solitary 11-year-old boy, Alex, trapped in the Warsaw Ghetto. Erga compared this text to the Ark of Time, Arka Chasu, Marcin Szczytkowski's tour de force time travel fantasy that takes its young protagonist and his friends back to the Warsaw Ghetto of the Holocaust and ahead to the Warsaw of the future. I want to expand that analytic and temporal frame by addressing a third text that completes this triptych of children's novels about Polish childhood and the literary approaches to treating difficult history in children's books. Janusz Korczak's King Matt I, published in 1922 in limited dissemination and in 1923 in widespread publication as a classic text of Polish children's literature from the pen of Poland's preeminent pre-war author of children's books and educational material. These three novels, depicting childhood in Poland over the span of 90 years, written by male authors born four or five decades after one another, gives us a synoptic view of the widely diverging conditions of childhood in Poland and the ways that children's authors of different eras and perspectives have used the conventions of their art, specifically the adventure novel, to portray difficult aspects of Polish and Jewish history, converging, of course, in the Holocaust. This literary kinship between Orlev and Korczak is long-standing and deep. It's based on myriad creative and personal factors. Both were born to Polish-Jewish secular families, firmly assimilated in the bourgeois world of Polish-Jewish Warsaw, albeit in different eras. Korczak, orphaned in his teens, came of age toward the end of the Rozbior, the Polish partitions, in Russian-occupied Poland and served as a medical officer in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905-1906. He dedicated his life to the benefit of children and developed into a legendary pedagogue, children's rights advocate, orphanage director, radio personality, and author. His best-known text, King Matt, begins with the title character's sudden coronation at age 10 as the child king of his native country following his father's untimely death. Matt's kingdom is soon invaded by three neighboring countries, a thinly veiled reference to the partitions of Poland by Prussia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Russia that had ended on only a few short years before Korczak's novel was published in newly independent and temporarily free Poland. If colonization and foreign aggression by neighboring powers are background to this novel, malfeasance and misrule by craven adults is its subject. Matt fights wars against the enemies of, or about, even as he fends off internal rivals. Throughout the novel, King Matt contends with corrupt or inept royal ministers who betray him when he commits himself to the benevolent rule and liberation of children within his realm. Although Matt yearns to join the children whom he sees engage in innocent play outside his palace walls, that serve also to keep him pent up in a prison of luxury, Matt undertakes a series of reforms that include opening a children's parliament and newspaper. He befriends a boy from outside his palace as well as the princess of an African state in a part of the text that is riven with racial stereotypes typical of its time. After a series of adventures, Matt is lured by his adult advisors into an ill-advised military fiasco. The novel ends with a young hero stripped of his throne, nearly executed, and exiled to a desert island. A 1923 sequel, King Matt on a Desert Island, continues the narrative. Although the text has nothing to do with the Holocaust, after all, it was written some 20 years before Korczak died in Treblinka, its logic of a precocious child 
forced to contend with adult challenges and dangerous adults at a young age, and its adventure structure set the template for the Holocaust text that Orlev and Szczytiansky would later write. Orlev's The Island of Bird Street also portrays a boy bereft of his mother and without his father who has been rounded up by the Nazis. The text also portrays a boy who yearns to join other children engaged in innocent play, whom Alex, the protagonist, can see outside the ghetto walls. As in King Matt, the protagonist of Bird Street at first pines for adventure and adult experience, only to meet with real peril and the isolation it brings when a savage war erupts, prompting a desire to return to simple companionship and the normalcy of childhood. In both texts, reality brings imaginative children more than they bargained for with the invasion of their homes by foreign armies that plunge these now parentless young protagonists into a series of violent, perilous encounters with capricious adults and dangerous circumstances. In both texts, the war is revealed as a horror rather than as a grand adventure. In both books, precocious children contend with responsibilities far beyond their years. Furthermore, in both novels, the main characters befriend a sensitive girl whose own predicament is one familiar to the protagonist. Alex and Matt also befriend the leader of a group of boys playing like normal children. In addition, while longing for their sagacious yet absent fathers, both characters find solace and counsel with a kindly, gen gentle doctor who keeps the boy's confidences. What does it mean that Korczuk's canonical early 20th century text in Polish about children's rights and Polish independence became the urtext for Orleb's 1981 Hebrew-language semi-autobiographical novel about a harrowing childhood in the Warsaw Ghetto, a text that opened new possibilities for Orleb and others to write for children about genocide? I'll let that question linger for a moment as I explore more of the bond between Korczak, Korczak and Orlev, and its significance for our topic of contemporary Holocaust literature. The connection between Bird Street and King Matt is more than merely circumstantial or based on plot structure. Orlev himself grew up reading Korczak and eventually came to be his most prolific translator into Hebrew years after they had both been incarcerated in the Warsaw Ghetto. Orlev's authoritative translation of King Matt was published in 1979, meaning he was translating Korczak when he was first working on Bird Street. Moreover, Bird Street's Alex names Korczak's King Matt as one of his favorite books. As he struggles to survive in the ghetto, Alex nourishes himself with food that he forages from the apartments of the dead and deported, which he also scavenges for books. While food wards off starvation, Reading keeps at bay the tedium of isolation. I don't know how I would have gotten through whole days, Alex says, from early morning to dark, alone by myself in our ceiling hideout or down below in the bunker. How long could I just sit there and read? Of course, if a book is really good, you can read it a second or even a third time, like Robinson Crusoe or King Matt. But you can't just read all day long every day. Alex's love of adventure stories at first persists as a means of escape into a realm of fantasy, but his attitude toward reading shifts as he gains first-hand experience, the likes of which, until then, he thought were only the stuff of fiction. Reading takes on a sustaining purpose for Alex. Alongside his constant search for physical nourishment, he strategically forages for literary sustenance. Quote, I knew exactly what to look for, for candles, and food. That was all I needed, except for a good book if I found one, he says. This recalibration of the relationship between the real tribulations of persecution and the literary genre of children's adventure is key to how Orlev makes innovative use of Korchak's example. What Korchak had done with King Matt was to adopt the literary trope of chival chivalric war and romantic conquest epitomized by Shankevich by fire and sword, and transpose it to the perspective of a child in a threatened state. King Matt seeks to fulfill the legacy of his noble forebears, 
only to founder on the shoals of treacherous bureaucracy and ministerial squabbles, translating the poetry of freedom into the prose of real children's rights requires governmental alliances and hard, tenacious work. That's precisely Korczak's point. He celebrates ideals and then shows how difficult it is to attain them for children. If King Matt brilliantly translates fantasy into reality, so too does Orleb's Bird Street. While Alex begins as a naive reader enamored of tales of warfare that he knows only from books, his lived experience during the Holocaust shows just how different reality is from romantic adventure. By the time Alex understands that the violent adventures he previously imagined for vicarious enjoyment were in fact, quote, happening to him, he abandons his romantic idealization of war. Just as Orled translated Korczak from Polish into Hebrew, he also follows Korczak's model of using literature to translate children's experience from the realm of fantasy into a realistic idiom. He portrays Alex as an avid reader of war stories and thereby forges an empathic literary connection with young readers of his own novel, who are likewise reading a text of war and adventure, albeit one that takes its responsibility to wrestle with the actual stakes of perverse adult ideology as seriously as did Korczak. Just as Alex grows as a reader and comes to understand the serious relevance of King Mad as a model for his own vastly different experience, Orlev trains his own readers to grapple with the real stakes of their own yet unknown future experiences. Both Orlev and Korczak evince deep respect for how young people reckon with reality, not as a miniaturized version of adult experience, but as a challenging arena of their own ordeals deserving of respect. I want to end by mentioning another element of how the bond between Korchak and Orlev may further command our attention. Orlev isn't only adapting or updating the King Matt model to the Holocaust. Rather, he's suggesting that Korchak's notion of children thrust into adult roles might be vital for how we consider children's representation of the Shoah. And here I return to Erga's other theme from her talk, time travel, as an organizing motif in the way that Szczegelski, as well as Galila Ron and Pedro Amit and, Ron and Jane Yolen from the United States represent the Shoah. I want to continue thinking along those lines of time travel by exploring its pedagogical, ethical, or even metaphorical connotations and its importance for literary depictions of the Holocaust for young readers. As Jacqueline Rose, Susan Stewart, Perry Nodelman, among others, have noted, children's literature always necessitates a degree of time travel by allowing for an adult author to inhabit the voice, perspective, or psyche of a child character or reader. Time is what distinguishes an adult from a child. Adults have had more of it, but keep less future time in store, than do children, who have had less time to enjoy in the past, but stand before a vast reserve of time stretching far into the future. This dimension of time becomes more confused and urgent when applied to the Holocaust and World War II which saw millions of children killed before their time. Many Jewish children, like the fictional protagonists of Olev's and Szczegielski's Warsaw Ghetto novels, were forced to assume the responsibility of mature adults while still children, before they're ready or before their time, as it were. Still more broadly, the legacy of the Holocaust continues to confound us in part because the Holocaust is history that refuses to remain history. To many Israelis, no doubt including many who still read or teach or live, the Shoah is not so much the Jewish past, but a nightmare vision of the Jewish future, should disaster befall us. As Sarah Minstow and others here know far better than do I, genocide is not strictly a lesson regarding the past, but a warning about the future. This partly accounts for the vital significance of the Holocaust, and for genocide education for children, who are not merely avatars of the future, but also heirs to a grim future which could ensue if a Santayana-like appreciation of history is not preserved. This bewildering notion of how the future somehow secures the past is implied in the time travel narratives of child accounts of the Holocaust. It's also a part of how Korchak has often been read. Korchak, as we all know, died in 1942, together with the children under his care, 
at the orphanage he ran in the ghetto. A prominent Polish cultural figure, he was offered opportunity to escape, but refused to abandon his children. This last act of selflessness elevated Korczak into a kind of secular martyr. Nearly 80 years later, Korczak's final crucible, particularly his last month, attracts more interest than does his decade of work as a tireless advocate, activist, and, and author of children. As a result, his long career is often perceived as prelude to his tragic death, a death that neither he nor anyone else could see, as if the future preceded his past and his decisions in August 1942 were the inevitable outcome of work that was foreordained in the 1920s. Time also really plays a different related role in the contemporary appreciation of Korczak's radical views on children's rights, which are invariably described as prescient, clairvoyant, precocious, ahead of their time. These reversals of time also figure into how Orlev described his relationship with Korczak. In a preface to the 2012 republication of his Hebrew translation of King Matt, Orlev described his sole personal meeting with Korczak in 1940 at a summer camp associated with Korczak outside Warsaw, where Orlev was with his teacher one afternoon when Korczak entered the room. His teacher introduced the man with the goatee as her own teacher and then left. Orlev writes, We stood together in this large room. I knew this was the man who wrote King Matt, but what made an impression on me was that this was my teacher's teacher. In other words, this was the individual who shaped my teacher before she shaped me. There was a chain of influence happening here. In his preface, Orlev whimsically continues, I looked at him with admiration. I didn't tell him that when I would be big, I would translate his books into Hebrew. At a time when the present was so fraught that most children at that camp would never survive to adulthood or to become big, Orlev retrospectively and humorously imagines what he would do long after the world of Korchuk and his children was destroyed, as if the future were already there even before the past had been extirpated. As if Orlev, before he spoke Hebrew, could communicate to Korchak how he would translate his books. This bending of time, folding in on itself and returning to the vortex of the Shoah, is essential to how Holocaust literature continues to evolve, in a blooming loop of the past, writing the future, but the present also rereading the past. Shuchdansky's 2013 novel can be read alongside Orlev's 1981 Island on Bird Street, which in turn was strongly influenced by Korchuk's novel King Matt I of 1922 and 23, a book that Orlev translated in 1979 at the time that he was writing Bird Street. Orlev's translation was reissued in 2012, the year declared the year of Korchuk. In the interim, Orlev translated many other texts by Korchuk, both literary and pedagogical. And I'll add that the past decade, has also seen two important publications by the artist and author Ivana Chmielewska, whose 2012 and 2018 books about Korczak maintain his legacy in Poland. These inversions of time are fundamental to how Korczak saw the world and childhood. He spoke about adults who shirk responsibility, about children who assume sovereign power, the many grown-ups who would do well to remember the inner child, the dziecku wysobie, one of his major programmatic works on parenthood and child development is titled When I Am Small Again, 1925. It offers a realization of the time travel metaphor, the fantasy of growing up to be a child once again. That text begins, you say, dealings with children are tiresome. You're right. You say, because we have to lower ourselves to their intellect. Lower, stoop, bend, crouch. But you are mistaken. It isn't that which is so tiring, but because we have to reach up to their feelings. The book inverts the axis of time and hierarchy of age by fantasizing, what would I do if I were little again, and reflecting that childhood is somehow our future. It wonders that perhaps it's a hundred times better to be little. This is perhaps Korchak's most profound legacy and his strongest influence on Orlev, and maybe on us. Children's experience is not merely a smaller, simplified, diminutive version of our reality, but instead its own account of life, sometimes even more vivid. This is what lies behind an acknowledgement Orlev makes late in his 1996 memoir, Mishakacho of the Sand Game, in which he justifies his children's depictions of the Holocaust 
not as a simplified account of experience, but as the only way he could write about the genocide. There is no grown-up way to talk, tell, or think about the things that happened to me, he writes. I have to remember them as if I were still a boy. That is not to condescend, not to diminish or to attenuate the past, but rather to present a children's literary account of war, one offered in the full measure of time. Thank you so much.